All been having a good DEF CON? <laughs> Man, come on, how can you not have fun here? Well, that's true, but... Oh. Yeah, and uh, one of the goons has an announcement, so... I've been asked to tell everybody that DT is in the dunk tank. DT is in the dunk tank, so if you would like to dunk him, he will be there. But unfortunately, you'll have to miss this talk, and from the look of the room, you probably don't want to miss this talk, so... I did my job, now you can have fun. Awesome, thank you. What were you talking about, Taylor? The, the, no. Okay, um, just so everyone knows, uh, I'm Linux. I run a site with a friend of mine called uh, noxfiles.com. It's basically a security research type of thing, and the first presentation released by us is about advanced uh, Windows-based firewall subversion. So this is not going to be just, you know, oh yeah, run it over port 80, the firewall won't notice, hopefully, type of thing. This is a lot more technical in th than that. There will be a lot of reverse engineering and payload development, all that fun stuff. So uh, get ready. All right. <laughs> okay, um, first of all, a little background. There's a prevailing mentality throughout all of InfoSec and the corporate world that, you know, applications aren't secure, so we pretty much need to uh, develop something to cover up for someone else's vulnerability. And many people believe uh, that a firewall, you know, an HIPS, I, I guess you could use the terms interchangeably to an extent, but their uh, HIPS and uh, personal firewall kind of do a little bit of a different thing. Well, they do the same thing, but in a different way. So, but there's one small problem. If we manage to exploit one of these vulnerable systems, we still have execution control. We still can do whatever the user running at that, you know, pr whoever uh, owns the process can. And attempts to stop us can be broken. It may be a little bit difficult, but they can be done. Now, some former research in this area, uh, I just wanted to cite uh, FRAC 62, number 13, article 13 in there. It presents some uh, standard methods for uh, bypassing uh, Windows-based uh, personal firewalls. Now, what it mostly involves is injection of code into a trusted process. But as you'll see later, a lot of firewalls will detect this type of thing. It's kind of, I, if I recall, this issue is kind of old, but it's still good code, so I do recommend you all check it out. It presents some different methods of doing it, and um, yeah, it is pretty good research. Now, there's another thing on this about why more research is needed in this field. Why is it important? These uh, personal firewalls, these HIPS-like systems, are getting more and more common they're pretty much moving to a point where firewalls, antivirus systems, and anti-spyware crap is going to be all in one product. You know, just you know, one, one thing, not a suite. And not to mention, you have a whole lot more file format bugs these days, like uh, just the WMF exploit, the uh, Excel uh, spreadsheet vulnerabilities that we've seen in, I guess, the past month or two. And in an application like Word, it, you know, it's kind of going to look funny if Word is trying to bind to a port. Now, it, now uh, maybe we want to get past that and not let the user know that that's happening or just be able to break out in general. Basically, we have to start breaking out of the cage, right? I haven't seen too many uh, exploit frameworks or anything do this type of, re uh, this type of research, these type of payloads or anything like that. It's kind of disappointing. But uh, that's why we have this talk. So the tools needed to do this. Basically, you need a debugger. OllieDBG is my choice. Many people prefer WinDBG. That's fine. A disassembler, not totally necessary if you have a debugger, but um, you know, IDA Pro is a good choice for this. And an assembler. Uh, I prefer NASM, and that's what the uh, Metasploit Payload Development Kit uses, so I, I guess why not? And um, you're going to need a compiler also. And I chose uh, Microsoft Visual Studio C++ 2005, and the, free, the Express version works, and it's free. So you know what? You can go home and compile my code and run it if it you know, works on your system, and I'll cover that later. So the first firewall we're, that we're going to go after is the Windows firewall. 
Uh, Service Pack 2 has brought us a, well, more improved firewall than the first one, and it, but you know it's integrated into Windows and offers a little bit more control than uh, the original. But there's a really big problem with this. Now, let me see, I'm gonna bring up uh, the MSDN uh, library, I have it on my system here. So let, let's search for a little string here, exercising the Windows firewall. All right, let's just uh, see what this comes up with. Okay, let's uh, see what this, oh, using the Windows firewall API, uh, exercising the Windows firewall, let's see what that does. Now, if my system would be fast, but okay. Now, Windows Firewall initialize. Let's see if we get to something interesting here. Windows Firewall is on. Turn on. Oh, and here's something funny. Windows Firewall turn off. Looks like it might do something that maybe people don't want it to do. So, as you can see here, uh, Microsoft has provided a full API or a, well, it's through a com interface that allows you to do all sorts of fun stuff. So you can do things like enabling a service, uh, basically allowing one application out, or, you know, here's my favorite method, um, put firewall enabled. Yeah, so you can just put, put firewall enabled variant false and what do you think that does? So it can, uh, you know, ar arbitrarily authorize op applications uh, to uh, basically, you know, al be allowed out through the firewall. And basically, the shell code here will uh, basically initialize a com object. Let me see if I can get the code up here so you can all see the C code that I wrote. Okay, I think it's uh, an FW killer. To remember which one this was because uh, the C code is not as important as the actual assembly payload. Okay, so basically what you're going to do is initialize com via co-initialize uh, co X and then you're going to initialize a com object um, which I believe is uh, netfw FW, uh, manager and then that has a method called get local policy and that um, FW policy also has a method called get current profile, which basically that contains a method called put firewall enabled and we just set it to variant false and that works. Sounds kind of funny, doesn't it? I mean, this shouldn't be that easy in my opinion. Now granted, you do have to run this as an admin to get it to work, but I, there are a lot of ways to uh, escalate your privileges inside of any operating system. You know, hard on the outside, somewhat more mushy on the middle. So, demos, they're important. If you don't do them, people look, like, look at you like you don't know anything, so that, all right. Basically, I wrote up a uh, payload for the uh, Metasploit framework. Can you bring the window just to the right and just Yes. Sorry. Okay. Great, uh, you're all able to see that fairly well. I'm not sure if I can get the font any bigger on this because it's in a virtual machine. But the bottom line, who all knows what the Metasploit framework is? All right, a good number of you. Just for those who don't know, um, the Metasploit framework provides an automated way to create and test exploits along with developing payloads for them. And just so happens the uh, developing payloads is kind of what I was doing here. So. It proved to be quite useful. All right. Now I'm just going to uh, bring up the Metasploit console here. If it will load. Uh, now there's a new version that's written in Ruby. I didn't have too much getting too much luck getting this payload to work with that. There are just some kind of quirk, there must have been some kind of quirks in there. I, HD had been fixing some stuff and I hear it's, um, there are a lot of the bugs uh, taken out of the Ruby version which is 3.0, but it seemed that uh, 2.6 was the one that I had the most luck with, so that's what I'm gonna stick with. Now to deliver this payload, 
the exploit that I'm going to use is the WMF exploit. And why this is important is if you think about it, there are a lot of a lot more cross-site scripting attacks are happening these days. You know, redirecting the user to you know some other arbitrary site. You know, getting data. You know, you have all this AJAX stuff where, you know, basically uh, you're able to funnel data in without the user knowing. Fun stuff like that. If you all had seen um, Billy Hoffman's uh, talk at Black Hat about that, that'd be a little bit more uh, informative on this subject. But cross-site scripting is uh, a lot bigger, and you have a lot of L users who have the tendency to click on any link if it kind of looks like it's trustworthy, even though it has like a script tag at the end and it says, I pwned you. I don't know, maybe, that, maybe that's just me. Okay, and I'll set the payload. This is a bind payload, by the way, to uh, demonstrate the fact that um, it seems that the Windows uh, ICF is very uh, tuned to basically blocking applications from binding. It doesn't do as much uh, against co stuff connecting out. But the reason that's important to be able to t disable this is what it will do is prevent you from accessing a lot of network resources. Now, if you want to be able to break into one system and own all the boxes on the network, uh, you will want to be able to do that. And you know, through SMB, you know, be able to browse the shares, all that fun stuff. So it is uh, an important thing to be able to do. OK, and exploit. So uh, now we have a bind handler. Well, it's not a bind handler. It's basically a, a makeshift uh, HTTP server. And in fact, the 2.6 can't actually shovel a shell on this. But so what I just did is you know, use Netcat like a normal to uh, gain that, okay, that's 28.120. Yeah. That's the default port that I'll be running on. So, okay, now um, let's see how usable this VM is because it, it the screen resolution got kind of uh, mangled in this whole process of setting it up. Now, okay, first of all, Go to the control panel, see if the firewall is actually enabled here. And scroll up a little bit. Yep, it's on. So, uh, and not to, I'm just going to leave don't allow exceptions uh, off because it really doesn't matter in this case. So, I'll go here. And I believe it was. Uh, I believe that was 128. All right. Yeah, so. OK, so it's going in. Now, you should see an image pop up here. Now, oh, fun. Do I want to keep blocking this? OK. Now, I wonder if I had set the payload correctly, because it, w it shouldn't do that. But to be, to be fair, this is why I have flash demos of this stuff, because uh, <laughs> All right, yeah. Sorry about this. I just uh, figured that there would probably be some screw up during this, but you will be able to see how truly powerful Windows XP firewall foo is. OK. Oh, man. God. All right. So let's see here. Can you read that at all? Now, you basically get a general outline of what's going on. So as you can see, I'm enabling the firewall right there. And then, OK, go back to my uh, terminal on my uh, Linux system. And I'm launching uh, the MSF console program right there. So basically, I'm doing the same thing that I was before, but this time it will work. So, <laughs> God, I love live demos. <coughs> now I'm just uh, entering the, pay the um, exploit to use right here. Excuse me? 
Yes, uh, and th the main reason I did that was the basically the way you know that this is working is if you do a bind one and you don't get that message that you saw on the other part. Now, I, I don't know, it was an act of God or something. I must have done something really bad last night, but um, okay, now why is that running so slow? All right, well, hopefully it'll get a bit faster here. Again, God, I love live demos. So let me see. A lot of disk activity because I have this virtual machine stuff running. And all right, I, I think I need to like close some things here, like the MSD and library that needs to go. Oh, fun! My system got locked up. Windows is exacting its revenge against me. That's, you know, it has a soul and all that. So, you, you know, you have all sorts of fun stuff going on there. Yeah, close that. Big memory hog. Yeah, very robust, as you can see. Now, oh, okay, now it seems to be running a lot faster. So, okay, yeah, now I'm um, doing exploit right there, so it's going to start the uh, HTTP server. And, what? Why did you, <laughs> I just killed you, good lord. Okay. Now, I'm um, waiting for the connection on, the, and then we'll go back to the VMware system right here and then run, and then basically I'm running iExplore and then the URL of that uh, malicious site. So just say some L user, you know, happened to click on that and some cross-site scripting uh, vulnerability. So basically, it's going to be pushed down. It'll run. And it will say, as you can see, your firewall got disabled. So therefore, if you'll wa wait for it here, I'm netcatting to the uh, port 444, which is the default port set up in Metasploit for which port to bind to, and we have a shell, as you can see. So it, did, it may have said something to the user, but we still owned them. So I mean, you could basically shovel in your own payload that would, you know, do something like load a rootkit. So oh, all of a sudden, you know, it doesn't really matter that they know anymore; they're still fucked. So, um, all right, let's see here if I can, yeah. Okay, now I'm just, jeez. Yeah, fun stuff here. Jeez, VMware, come on, it's supposed to be reliable. Sorry for this, but all right, let's see. That should be in full screen. Oh, well, now we have this fun up here. So if you can ignore that, um, <laughs> yeah, everything that can go wrong will go wrong. So that it's just one of the rules here. So uh, the next firewall that we're going to go after is the Zone Alarm Personal Firewall. Um, and this is actually a little bit of an older version compared to the new one, and I will discuss the new one. Now, this is one of the main personal firewalls used. It, you know, everyone talks about Zone Alarm all the time. And these uh, personal firewalls have a hard job because they have to defend from threats locally and remotely, aka people like me. So. Um, one thing, one of the most important components in, in this firewall is called True Vector. It's basically a driver and it's what, a, it's basically, you know, the network part of it and Zone Alarm is really pretty much a GUI on top of it. This is basically a beneficial rootkit to your system and it's basically what keeps it safe from all sorts of uh, local threats and what have you. And it's quite aggressive about defending itself, as you will see. So reversing Zone Alarm. Our plan of attack here, we need to get write access to the zlclient.exe process and inject code into it that will disable the firewall. We need to run that code and make sure it's done quasi-stealthily so then you don't have all sorts of you know, flashing buttons come up on the screen and what have you. And I'm going to call it ZA Router. So first, we have to find the process. 
we need to find a zeal client.exe's PID, process ID. Now first, we'll run enum processes to get a process list and open and then use open process with process with the parameter of process query information to be able to basically enumerate um, through what what certain like the actual name of the executable. So um, then we'll use uh, enum process modules to get the module handle of the process and get module base name A to get the process name. Then we can just uh, continually string compare this to zeal client.exe and when we hit that we'll know that we have the right process. Now there's a big problem here. True vector for us is a pest. It behave, as I said before, it behaves like a rootkit. Um, it hooks a lot of system calls and this is why you cannot just do a terminate process on the firewall. Although I think if you follow the route that I've used to this, you actually can do a terminate process on the firewall, but it's pretty much going to kill all network activity, so you don't want to do that. And that's one of the reasons I took the route that I did. And the most important call that it hooks, at least for us, is NT open process. If that's hooked by zone alarm and it's doing you know what it does, you know, preventing us from trying to attach to it, we will not be able to get a handle to zeal client.exe and our code can't run. We won't be able to inject any code into the process. And that's a very big problem because how else are you, you know, you're gonna shut it off. So enter the ZA router driver. Now the funny thing in this version of Zone Alarm, true vector or zone alarm, whatever it you know is doing it in, in the back end, does not mind if we load a driver. Ooh! Rootkit, hello. So we can write to the uh, system service dispatch table, and this mean, and we can execute code on the same level as true vector. So guess what? We can over, uh, we can unhook every system call that it hooked. Yeah. So basically, here we have the pseudo rootkit because it doesn't really do anything malicious other than unhook a system call, and no one's really going to notice that. But actually, you you can, but it's like. The norm, for a normal user, even if they got their hands on one of these programs that you can, you know, you can view the syscall table, it's like, oh no, there's one less hook in there, so I'm less vulnerable, something like that. So um, basically uh, an outline of what, uh, how this will work. We'll create a memory descriptor um, list for the, S the system service dispatch table, which is basically using uh, this uh, decal spec right here. Now that's not the most stealthy way to do that, but if you read rootkit.com, you'll find out some other ways to make this a bit more stealthy. And then we'll unhook uh, NT open process and replace it with the address of the original syscall. Well, the original code that ran it. So it turns out that zone alarm didn't actually, you know, rip out the code of that old system call. All it did was redirect it to its own stuff. So it's still there. You just have to find the address of it and use it. So basically, uh, what it will, what what you'll have to know is the you'll have to know the, the the syscall number and the address, and that differs between service packs. And I know my code isn't the most portable. After you see what's going on, but you can make it portable. So <laughs> I'll discuss that later, though. And basically, we have a macro here that's called hook syscall. Basically, it takes a syscall number and an address, and it'll set it to that. And I can actually bring up the code on here. If my computer doesn't explode, just please pray that it doesn't, because that was kind of odd last time. All right, you go back to. Okay. Let me go to ZA Router Driver here. All this code will be up on the Noxus Files website, by the way, after the con. So. Okay, let me see zarooter.c. And of course, you have to edit these with Vim because if you don't use Vim, you're not lead, of course. It's just a rule. But anyway, as you can see, that some of this is kind of messy because I was kind of experimenting about which calls to unhook and what I could do with that, but I basically commented out the ones that don't really matter for our purposes. So you basically have an array of, um, you know, what the address we want to set the hooked syscall to and basically an array of syscall numbers that we want to unhook. So um, basically right here, it will iterate through all of this, and then it will say if you have a um, debug event viewer on your system, you can actually see you know, status unhooking syscall number blah with address of you know, blah. So it will unhook the syscall and basically will win. So that's the important thing. 
So now we have to find a way to shut it off. Now this takes some reverse engineering right here. And it basically after a while of grinding through code, you find that there's this little function at, the lo at this uh, hex location right here. And it seems to be a pretty reliable address, so it you know, doesn't change a whole lot, but, uh, or at all that I've seen. And basically the funny part is, if you can see uh, T TVTF uh, force shutdown right there, yeah. So anyway, um, basically, if you pass it a value of four, it will tell true vector basically to you know screw off and you know don't do anything. So that's uh, pretty fun. So we can uh, call that via code that we inject into the firewall. Now, um, if you try to do this, is actual. If I recall correctly, methods that um, are basically at a lower level than this are in some of the zone, zone alarm DLLs, but don't try to call them because it pretty much won't work. It has some sort of authentication stuff that basically knows whether you're running it actually from the firewall or not. So, problem number two we have a lot of alerts that are going to pop up. You know, that sucks. We don't want the user to know that we're actually rooting them. So um, you have icon changes, you have a text box like right here, and you have that nice uh, you know, message system error, please reboot. Maybe that would you know, alert people that there is something a little bit wrong and all that fun stuff. So we basically need to get rid of these. Now salute, the first one is there is a, there's an icon change. As you can see right there, there's a big X and then it will say true vector security service is shut down. We don't want the user to see that because they might wonder why a big red X is in the bottom of their system. Although with some users these days it may not matter but we, we, want, we still want to be uh, cautious here and do what we can. So what's kind of funny is um, shell notify icon basically takes two parameters and one is uh, like the, the message it's going to send and this um, notify icon data structure right here. Now I didn't research into all what that did but basically the bottom line is it changes the icon and we don't want it to. So we can pretty much replace that call with add ESP8 after it's pushed the parameters and there is no more call. Because if it, do any of you know how like the stack works when calling a function like an assembly language? I anyone? Okay. Well, the bottom line is things get pushed onto the stack, kind of like you stack, you know, you stack plates, and the front, like the where the top plate is, that's where this register called ESP is, and basically, and indirectly, it will reference all of the arguments from that. So all this does is pretty much set, resets that pointer, you know, from the top of the plates or the stack, depending on how you want to think of it, further back. So it, it pretty much doesn't matter that they had these arguments for it. So basically, we just killed that call. So we win. Now the screen text it uses a few resource strings in the .rsrc section of the portable executable. For those of you who do not know, the PE is the format, you know, like you have an exe file, you run that, that's PE. So basically, you, you see all these like system error, error uh, messages and whatnot, well, we can just overwrite them with our own. Sounds good. So, um, and it uses draw text to write this to the screen. That's a, um, I believe, GDI call, if I'm not mistaken. I think it's in user32.dll, but that's kind of not important right now. So, what we're going to do is have a user mode hook on draw text. Now, because we want to see whenever it's going to try to spit these nasty messages out. Now, what we're going to have to do first of all is pretty much preserve the program state at that moment. We can use these uh, um, opcodes right here, push A, push FD, pop FD, pop A. Basically what that does is it saves the it saves the state of all the registers and pushes it onto that stack, you know, the plate thing. So, and then um, also it does this for a flags register too. And basically that has some, has some info about whether you're going to, you know, jump this way, jump that way. But the bottom line is we're saving the program state. Everyone understand that? Yeah. Okay, good. Now, um, what we're basically going to do is where you see this move, uh, EBX uh, ESP uh, plus 2C after the um, push add and push FD. 
that's basically looking at one of the arguments of draw text. So it's basically seeing what text is going to be written and it will check it for all. Now, I think I forgot to explain the reason why I did this. Um, <laughs> but if you see here, that's red. System error, please reboot, that's all in red. Now, if you notice when it's running normally, let me see if I ha have it running in the virtual machine here. Okay. Oh no, okay, uh, oh, that's all right. Yeah, I have that basic reminder there, but you saw it work, so that's important. Um, wait, that's not gonna show it either. I'll just run um, Zenalarm on this. Now, if, come on. Zoom Labs, okay. All right, now if we can wait while this program runs and it will start up. But the bottom line is it's all in green. So we don't wanna have flashing red messages everywhere, that's gonna be a problem. Now I'll, I'll come back to that, that's gonna take forever to load uh, with the amount of stuff I'm running on this. So um, basically we're going to check for all because you know that's the message. We want, we want it to say all systems are active. That's pretty much what, uh, what the original message was and that's what we did with the overriding in memory. Now um, pretty much what it's going to do is if it's there, it's just going to run set text color to set the text to green. And then we basically do the rest of the stack setup and then we win. Now there's one issue here. How are you going to transport that driver over to the infected, u well, the exploited user system? Now one approach here is to include this as a resource in a DLL. Now the nice thing about the Metasploit framework is that a guy named Scape wrote this uh, little payload that did DLL injection basically over TCP, remote DLL injection. Now, if you've ever seen um, someone, I don't know, get a remote desktop display after running an exploit through VNC on someone else's box, that's it. That's what it's all about. Basically, you can transport a full program, no assembly language programming required, in a DLL, and they'll run it. Unfortunately, um, my, my DLL had some problems with that. Like, it worked in the, oh, okay, here we are. Allow that, so um, just to, show you again, like with the green text. It's right here, see all systems active, so yeah. Sorry my computer's being a bit schizophrenic, but th that's okay. Um, and so what I was talking about is transporting this driver, this malicious, quasi-malicious driver over to the other person's machine. So what we can do is include this as a resource, like in that .rsrc section that you saw before, we can throw files in that and all sorts of fun stuff. So we can use the find resource function, load resource, and basically write it to the disk to, of course, write it to the disk. And then uh, use the um, system control manager to load the driver. Now somehow during this, we're going to have to coerce this program into executing this code. Fortunately, Windows offers some uh, process um, I guess you would call it interaction functions. Basically, the interfaces that you use for writing a debugger are the ones you kind of use here. And come to think of it, what this is really like is, it, do all of you know what a loader is like with software piracy? Like if you, um, if the program is packed and you want it to decrypt itself and then inject the code later, what you can do is write a loader. And so basically it will use write process memory and all, all, all this other stuff to basically wait a certain amount of time, inject the um, code to disable like your serial check or what have you into the process and um, then it will be okay. Some of them are more intelligent than others but th it's not that important here because we're not doing, dealing with any uh, obfuscation or encryption. But um, this shutdown code that I just that I was talking about before, remember if I, I told you to pass this a parameter of four it shuts the firewall off deal will be, re it, I basically went through the executable and found a whole bunch of slack space to write it into. So it's going to be pretty reliable. We don't, won't have to make um, it really position independent in this case. Like, because jumps and stuff like that to other memory, uh, other memory addresses can be thrown off depending on where you are in memory. So I pretty much picked a static one and it's worked. So uh, don't question it. <laughs> so um, now what we're going to do is run this one function called create remote thread. 
basically it does what it says. It creates a remote thread. You basically pass it the starting address of where you want to uh, start your code, and then it'll run it. Sounds fun, doesn't it? I mean, just running code in other applications? God, that's awesome. So um, we do this after we've changed all the strings and injected uh, the hooks like on draw text and what have you. So we're going to have a demo. And this will hopefully work a lot better than the last one. Because I've tested it on here. And by god, you know, it, it needs to work. But I have a flash demo in, in case it doesn't, just so you know. Um, now, what this metserve test thing is, is it's a program that the Metasploit people use to test their thing called the Metterpreter. How many of you know what the Metterpreter is? OK, that, that's a few people. But for those of you who don't know, basically the Metasploit people had this idea to throw something like, to put it in layman's terms, a hacker's command prompt into your system remotely. And it will do this over DLL injection. And to test their payload, of course, what they would do is write a test program to load it. So that's what they did. And basically, I'm too lazy to edit their code. So it will pop up an alert saying that it's binding to a port. And it, it's completely unnecessary. But it was just for the way they have it set up is you want to be able to actually view what's going on. And but with this, it's pretty much a blind shove it in and run. So when it's actually, it's going to listen on a certain port, as you can see, I've already ran this, so it's listening on port 31337, you know, because of course that's the lead thing to do. And um, once you connect to that port, however, it'll just run the DLL. So as you can see, there, it, this is just a whole test thing. It doesn't really affect the uh, performance of the DLL. So we're going to run this. Okay, start that running, it's going to listen. Yeah, as, see, like I told you, allow that. Okay, now I will, basically I'm going to do this the ghetto way and pretty much open up a web browser and tell it to go to that port. <laughs> so um, we'll run that and it will come up. And oh, you got owned. You know, gonna have a message box there. So that'll run two, time, two times and so then, oh, look at that. Your firewall just got disabled and guess what? Doesn't really say much about it, much here about what just happened. It's kind of fun, isn't it? And in fact, one fun thing is that if you're waiting for a pr like, say you want to ping someone, right? And you run the ping command, and then it will say, you know, allow or disallow this traffic. If you run this, that alert will stay up, but it won't matter. So the user is like, oh, I'm gonna be, you know, the big man now. You know, click deny. Well, it's not really gonna do anything. So. That was the demo there. So the, I didn't include like getting a shell on it, but I'm sure all of you, the bright minds out here can figure out how that works. So I went in after we've basically reversed these two firewalls and done some pretty you know technical in-depth methods of breaking them, right? So I tested some other firewalls, you know, with basically some general tests. If we could inject code into another process and have it run, I did this in a very ghetto fashion. What I basically did is opened up Internet Explorer and OlliDBG, used a Metasploit payload generation program to generate a payload, and with some said magic, I could extract it and paste the payload in. So it would just, you know, basically run the shell code. But it, yeah. So um, what, it'll test for that. And also the ability to debug the main firewall process. Obviously, if you it, as you saw in this, if you can debug the main firewall process, you pretty much owned it. So, and also whether syscalls were hooked in an obvious manner, basically because the whole idea is that if they were, then you could use the same driver that I wrote to unhook them. So, and yeah, basically the ability to load drivers too, because that's important. You know, you don't want rootkits to be able to be loaded on your system. Uh, Wait, I forgot to change it. OK, so the first one we're going to uh, talk about is Karyo. Now, the main process can be debugged. So it kind of, it, I haven't done any actual, like, I'm going to turn this off, and here's the DLL for it, like I did for Zone Alarm. But it, if the main process can be debugged, it's safe to assume that we can turn it off. OK, so, um, but, it act, but to its credit, it does detect code injection into trusted processes. But it didn't seem to detect a driver load either. So, yeah. Komodo. This is another popular firewall I've seen. 
and the main process cannot be debugged. It has non-obvious hooking methods. And it also detected code injection into a trusted process. But here's the, the kicker. It didn't seem to be able to, to detect a driver load. So, and the latest Zone Alarm Pro, and actually, th this is the latest version, and um, it's learned its ways from, the pre from uh, my previous DLL. It does, does detect uh, code injection into a trusted process. You cannot debug the main firewall process, and it does detect driver loads, and that's one of the f few, if only, firewalls I've seen that does that. So props to Zone Alarm for you know, um, do, doing this, implementing this mechanism. And, but it does uh, seem to have the same hooking mechanism as before. So the idea is if you're able to get rem uh, kernel, execution, kernel mode code execution, you can still disable it pretty simply. So now uh, let me go back here just a minute. And what more needs to be done? OK. Oh, I was supposed to talk about that after zone alarm. I'm sorry. But the, the thing with my zone alarm payload or DLL is basically that it really needs more portability to it. If you run this between different pa service packs or patch levels, even it'll blue screen because it would basically tell you know that the hook on NT open process to jump into an uh, area of memory that well it didn't have the right code at it because it changed. So, and it needs to be able to uh, have basically more dynamic resolving of the functions that are used like that set text color, because uh, we, if you run it as is now, you can have basically jump errors. I didn't do any arithmetic on calculating uh, jump offsets and whatnot, so that's going to break your program. And more intelligent generation of the uh, jump hook that was placed on draw text, so we could you know make it green and whatnot. Uh, okay, so conclusion. Things to be learned here. Firewalls are just applications, and they're not really the end all of security. Somehow, some way, you're going to be able to break it. And some subverting them will only increase in importance later, because more and more people are going to be running it, more and more people are going to be dependent on it. You know, you have Vista that has HIPS-like features in it as well, so you're going to have some more code that's going to come out for that by various researchers. And uh, so pretty much this is the end of the speech, but thanks to HD Moore who helped me write the, um, the Windows Firewall Disabling Payload, Poncho, of course, helped me with the Nox, uh, Noxus Files website and Optics. I know you're not here, but thanks anyway. You've uh, had some great insight to stuff. So if you want, uh, the code should be up at noxusfiles.com later in the day, like about an hour or two. So uh, get the code, you know, play around with it, test it out, everything like that. So that's the end. Any questions? <laughs> Any questions? Uh, yeah, and use the mic, please. I have a question. Um, yes, I Ducky. saw how you were, um, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not that person. Um, <laughs> With disabling all the uh, alerts and stuff, what about the actual disabling the Windows alerts, the balloon yes. pop-ups? This, um, that is done via the uh, WMI interface, and I imagine that if I uh, took a look and saw actually what that did, I would be able to kill it, because I know there have to be API calls for doing this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for, for anyone who knows about that type of thing, you know, feel free to download the code, implement that, and then, you know, contribute to it. So that's my uh, charge for you guys. Thank you. Yes. Uh, the Symantec firewall, did you uh, experiment with that? No, I did not. Um, I uh, basically uh, took those three firewalls. I, I, I kind of added that in at the last minute. So um, I, I didn't have the chance to get actual, you know, firewalls that costed stuff. So, uh, yeah, because of course no one wants to pirate here, right? Uh, just saying. Yeah. Next question. I'm curious on the... Um on your experience and what you found for disabling the firewall and getting at people since they're probably behind NAT versus just doing reverse shell? Uh, well, it, there are, uh, what was the question again? But behind a NAT? Um, I mean, if you were doing a reverse shell or reverse meterpreter, pretty much that would subvert the NAT now, wouldn't it? Yeah. 
Yeah, so, um, but the reason, if you're, are you wondering about the bind that I did with the XP firewall? Yes. Um, that was basically to show, because uh, the Windows XP firewall, um, it pretty much blocks the bind. That's what it's most concerned with more than anything else. And so by having you be able to get a bind shell, that shows for certain that it was disabled. So that was basically a proof of concept right there. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. I was just curious to see if this presentation was on the DEF CON CD. Yes, it is. Awesome. There, uh, the last slides, I think, about the um, other personal firewalls on there that I kind of smoke tested a little bit are not. But, it, I mean, that's n not the most important thing in the world. But you'll be able to download them from noxusfiles.com. So, Sweet. You yeah. rock. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, no, I, I'm currently not wearing pants. Yeah. Yeah, so... <laughs> All right, I hope you have a, you've had a great DEF CON and will continue having a great DEF CON. Thanks for coming.